Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, both online as well as, uh, as here in the audience uh, on the uh, uh, panel, which uh, is about encryption and the impact of um, um, encryption uh, policies happening in the global north uh, and the impact they have on the global south. We have a, a, a room with approximately, I would say, 15 to 20 people uh, uh, physically here, and we have a, a number of people online, uh, I would say about five, six, uh, excluding the speakers. Um, thank you for all being here. My name is Olaf Kolkman. I'm with the Internet Society, and I will be your moderator today. Um, as I said, um, this is about encryption policies in the global north uh, impacting uh, 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 the, the, the ability to communicate throughout the world. Um, since 2022, there have been a number of legislative proposals introduced that threaten end-to-end -end encryption. End-to-end -end encryption is the ability to communicate with confidentiality and integrity uh, from one user to the other. In the United States, we saw the Earnet Act being reintroduced even. Uh, there is also the Stop CSAM Act and the Kids Online Safety uh, Act, um, all bills that are circulating as proposals and uh, uh, being looked at, I would say. In the European Union, there's a proposal of chat control. Um, the, only, uh, the online uh, safety bill has become an act, it's now the Online Safety Act, it contains also a, a threat to strong encryption. Um, and it instructs Ofcom to come up with a solution to find harmful content, while a community of uh, security researchers and practitioners have brought consensus that such uh, solution doesn't quite exist. During the development of the bill, um, that's the online harms bill, um, various providers of encrypted services uh, announced already that if that bill uh, would come uh, in effect and uh, actions would be uh, taken that, that the bill enables, that they would take their business elsewhere. Um, these are all laws that uh, focus on specific regions of the world. Um, as I said, uh, Europe, uh, the UK, the US, um, those are very specific uh, uh, areas of the globe, but their effects are felt all over the place. Because, of course, we know the internet is global. This panel we put together um, uh, that is uh, uh, um, a number of us um, to uh, assess how these measures, when introduced, impact other regions of the world, and in particular, the Global South. Now, we have an excellent panel, uh, expert panel to discuss this, uh, consisting of uh, five people, two of them here, three of them online, uh, again showing the global nature of, uh, of, uh, of this discussion. Um, we have with us uh, Juliana Fonteles, who is sitting next to me. Juliana is a consultant for a specific, for special report on freedom of expression of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And she's also a, a researcher at Modera Labs um, and a, a collaborator at the best, for, uh, best Practice Forum on Gender and Digital Rights in the IGF. She has been a, re a researcher at Interlabs and a project assistant at the Brazilian Association of uh, Investigative Journalism. Welcome. We also have Masayuki Hata. Masayuki Hata is currently an associate, uh, associate professor of economics and management at the Surugaidai University of Japan. Sorry if I, if I, if I uh, butchered that name. 
Um, and you were originally trained as an economist and uh, organizational theorist, uh, and you write and speak extensively on intellectual property issues. But you also have, uh, uh, I, I, I think that is a hobby, um, which is very much uh, related to, um, uh, to encryption, uh, and that's as a contributor to the, to the Tor product, project and other um, uh, privacy-enhancing technologies. Online, we have a number of uh, speakers, contributors. We have uh, Mariana Canto, and she is a visiting researcher and German uh, Chancellor Fellow at the Berlin Social Science Center in Germany, director of the Institute for Research and Law and Technology of Recife, IPREC, in Brazil, PhD candidate in law at the University of Stirling in the UK, where she's part of the interdisciplinary cluster on democracy, human rights, and communication advocacy in the digital age. Further, we have Pablo Bello, he's also online. Pablo is the director of public policies at WhatsApp for Latin America. He graduated in economics, uh, economics from the University of Chile, in addition to having an MBA in business from ESADA in uh, Barcelona in Spain. He worked at the Inter-American Association of Telecommunication Companies, where he held the position of executive director. He was also Chile's assistant secretary of telecommunication between 2002 and 2006. Welcome. Pratik Wagre, I, I actually, I hope I'm not butchering your name. Pratik is a policy uh, a director at IFF. He's a technologist turned public policy prof uh, professional. And Pratik has spent nearly a decade in the CDN industry as a consultant and product manager. Since moving to public policy, his research work has focused on a number of areas such as internet shutdowns, information disorder in the information ecosystem and governance of digital communication networks and social media in India. Pratik is also an alumnus of the U.S. State Department's International Visitor Leadership Program on disinformation in the Quad. So, those are the speakers today, and you are the audience, and I expect a little bit of uh, engagement. Um, if all is well, um, we are about to share, Marcos is about to share, Marcos uh, Pereira, who is online, is about to share a QR code to a Mentimeter board. And if all is good, that will appear there. So we have a bunch of questions just to heat you up, participate with us, grab your phone, and if you cannot scan the QR code, type in menti.com and enter the code 68312810. I repeat, 68312810. And we are offering you a bunch of questions um, that we hope you can add and we hope we get some insights from those questions. Uh, what is the risk of fragmentation in encrypted services offered? Have and have not. Or talk to or talk not to. We see um, responses coming in, and I'm going to wait a while so that people also online can, can participate. This was, a, this was a thing at the IGF. Eh? How do we make things interactive? So um, this is our experiment here. I haven't seen it in other rooms yet. Well, thank you. I think uh, we leave it at that. Um, um, uh, high would be uh, uh, will be ten, of course, and low would be zero. And I think that what we see here uh, uh, as a question or as a as a result is that uh, uh, people think that there is uh, indeed uh, a risk of fragmentation in encrypted uh, services offered. May. Come again. Take an example of what is fragmentation. Uh, th that's what I mean with have and have not. People who are able to use encryption services and people who are not able to use those services. 
or services that only exist in a particular region. So uh, there is a, 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 an encrypted uh, uh, application that is only available in Latin America and you cannot talk to me in, in Europe. That would be fragmentation for me. So people are still entering their numbers. I, I find it interesting that there is uh, some low votes. Um, um, perhaps we come back to that uh, uh, in the, in the Q&A. And I will ask you to raise your hand if you were uh, one of the low voters, like uh, uh, you don't think there is fragmentation at all or barely, um, and, and explain why you think that. Um, I'm, I'm actually interested in that answer, and we'll pick that on the, on the, on the, on the question, question and answer section if I don't forget to return to that. I believe we also have a second question on the sheet. Um, do we have? We have three, I believe. How can the internet ecosystem and human rights be affected by the uh, extraterritorial effects of anti-encryption policies from other countries? So, for instance, um, the Online Safety Act, how can that uh, impact other jurisdictions? And I believe that this uh, country has uh, a number of uh, uh, words that you can fill in. Always interesting to see what comes out. I'll, I'll wait a few seconds. Okay, let's uh, let's see what the result is. Ah, see, now we see the word cloud uh, building. That is what is happening. I don't know what a surveyed surf serfdom future is. Ah, I, I think I know what it is, yes. A life in servitude, perhaps. Ah, okay. And what does it mean? I, I'm going to ask you then what you mean by that sentence. I mean, if we are allowing um, uh, surveillance or um, backdoors to encryption at this moment in time, it's um, a slippery slope. Um, and I think everyone knows that. And the whole discussion on um, child pornography is just used. Um, I mean, I it's one good reason why you would want that, but um, it's used to weaponize anti-encryption policies around the world. Thanks. Uh, I think we have one more. Just have a look at this. I think this is not a very positive image, if I may summarize it as that. Do we have no, yet uh, another question? No, the third one is the one that we finished the workshop, so it's the ah, same question as the, the previous yep. one. See if we um, had some change in the opinion. So let's, let's, let's uh, ask our panel a couple of questions. Um, so Masayuki, starting with you. Um, the internet has become essential for public and private services. Everybody is essentially using the internet. Um, and in countries such as Brazil and India, encrypted services such as WhatsApp and Signal, uh, Telegram, um, all those type of services, and not only in Brazil and India, um, are being used by big and small companies to run their businesses. And of course we're using Brazil and India because they're very, very big countries. In your, in your point of view, um, um, how uh, do encryption policies from the global north impact global south economies? Mm, it's very, very difficult <laughs> question <laughs> for answer because um, I live in Japan and uh, I think, I'm not sure about global south. I, I have been to India or Brazil and 
I think in Japan, many people don't know about encryption, or more specifically, many people don't know they are actually using encryption, you know, usually. Uh, which means, for example, in Japan, uh, so many people, almost every people, are uh, using um, application, uh, smartphone application called Line. Uh, Line is something like WhatsApp. So I, I'm pretty sure in India or Brazil, Global South, uh, WhatsApp is widely used. And uh, in Japan, Line is uh, very widely used. And uh, Line has a uh, protocol called letter sealing. It's end-to-end um, -end, uh, encryption protocol. So I think um, one big issue before uh, we think about the foreign influence or something to Global South is actually, uh, I'm not sure how many Global South people know they are using uh, encryption already. I'm, I'm not sure is, is this the answer to your question. Um, but suppose that people are using uh, 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 they uh, they are using encryption without knowing it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Still, if they are not able to use encryption and 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 the confidentiality that is now offered is taken away from them. What do you think would be the impact? So, we, we, I mean, they don't know they are using encryption already, so they might not be aware that uh, when encryption is prohibited or gone. I think that's uh, one of the problems, I guess, we face, because um, we or they don't know the true value of encryption without knowing it. And I think that's a situation in my country or uh, global south. Thank you. Um, I, I think we might return back to that. Um, Mariana Canto, let's see. Um, where are you? You are online. Um, the current geopolitics, um, shaped by the history of uh, colonization, um, and new forms of do uh, dominance reflect the perspective of the global north. Um, at least that's uh, something that, that, that we hear often. Um, uh, not to dismiss that in, in the way that I said that uh, a minute ago. Um, in your evaluation, um, how do the power dynamics of the global north impact the construction and development of cybersecurity policies in the global south? Is the tech dominance, the colonial nature, sort of colonial history, does that play a, ro a, a role in all of this? Um, over to Mariana. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation first. It's a pleasure to be here. It's always an honor to be at the IGF. And I thank you, Isaac, and I also thank you, Ip Heck, for the invite. Uh, in relation to the question, I think Global South countries, they tend to follow general trends that happen in the global north. Sometimes due to necessity, for example, transnational regulations such as the GDPR, and because if you don't adhere to this kind of regulation, you're excluded from the global market. Other times due to what is perceived as a global trend, for example, the import of narratives produced in the global north. For example, in the case of encryption, by law enforcement actors. However, those imports of narratives, especially for this latter case, are very dangerous when you have open discussions happening in the judiciary, for example, as the case in Brazil. For those who don't know, I'm from Brazil. And we have been uh, following the recent discussions in the, in the judiciary since the shutdown of WhatsApp in 2015 and 16. So, when you import those narratives and during those kind of discussions happening at the same time, those dilemmas can be tricky and can harm encryption many times. So I think it's also important that those measures such as the, the weakening of encryption can have extraterritorial effects in relation to the application of the law in other countries such as the UK now act 
but also in relation to the input of those narratives. So the extraterritoriality is not only in relation to the application of the law, but also how the narratives work around the globe. Uh, so, for example, even if the, the country does not uh, choose to adhere to that certain regulation, precedents can make uh, a risk for encryption to exist in a certain country. I talk about the online safety bill, but I also now act, but I also we, we've been following on the kinds of uh, regulations that are European uh, ones that are being developed and that are very much influenced on our bills on fake news, for example, and our AI strategy too, that's following the AI Act in Europe. Uh, it's impossible to talk about encryption in Latin America, and I would say, without talking about uh, power asymmetries and the regulation of encryption and regulation itself, it's impossible to talk about law without connecting to the real world because regulation does not operate in isolation. We know that it needs the real world to function. Otherwise, it's just useless text. And in relation to privacy, I, I question sometimes the privacy concept that we use uh, according to some experts like Paya Aurora, we're gonna have a legislation that's based on privacy concepts that for example, still consider privacy related to attitudes of Western-based white and middle-class groups. So in this case, privacy is a privilege of many. And we can see this not only now, but during over the years and centuries and centuries, such as when Simone Brown talked about the lantern laws in the US that you would have people being obligated, people of color being obligated to carry a lantern with them in order to be surveilled. So privacy is a privilege, and I believe that still nowadays it's a privilege of the very few people in the world. And the weakening of encryption tends to even accentuate this kind of power symmetry. Uh, today we have a very, very serious agenda that's being uh, discussed, which is a child sexual abuse material online. And it's a very, very difficult matter to address. And even more when you see that uh, survivors and victims are not being heard in most discussions that comes. We talk, when we talk about encryption, when we talk about regulation, we still consider children as unable or lacking in agency. And that for me, it's a very relevant matter in order to include those voices in the debate. And not only the victims and the, and the survivors, but also the people that work with uh, those, those subjects and those people. So I think it's very important to understand the power asymmetry, not only in relation to the global south and north, but also in relation to the people who are connected to the issue, in this case, children versus law enforcement authorities. But as the discussion is also connected to global north and south, we can see that the global south countries are still being highly affected by policies that are not made by them. And they are still perceived as uh, unable to enforce the rights, to quote, I would say, and as many times open air laboratories for highly intrusive uh, technology. Uh, we've seen, we've, we've been following lately after the Pegasus case and the investigation of the PEGA committee that uh, a highly intrusive technology is being used and exported to countries in the global south with the permission of the global north in, in countries that defend human rights. So even uh, this kind of, is this regulation really enough to protect the global south? I, that's my question. Like sometimes I, I wonder if our notion of privacy is enough to uh, protect all of vulnerable groups in the world. And unfortunately, I don't have many answers. I have more questions than answers, but I would love to debate uh, these, this questioning of the status quo, let's say, and how we can bring our, our region to the center of the debate and to be heard. And then it's such a, a very important debate for all of us. I think that's it. Thank you so much.
thank you, Mariana. Um, um, if I may, so I'm looking up because the screen is there. Um, if I may um, ask a, a cl clarifying question. Um, in the context of, you were just talking about questions around the status quo, and I was trying to understand how would I summarize that status quo, and I, 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 I call it lack of sleep, I couldn't. Could you summarize the status quo as you have it in your mind, just in a, in a line or two? I think the current status quo in relation to encryption, we still see encryption as a threat to vulnerable groups. And I don't think this is how we should receive encryption. I think encryption can be a, a huge ally to those who are underprivileged and, and those who are in a situation of yeah, power symmetries. So I think we have to question this narrative or maybe the status quo that encryption is still perceived by some actors as a barrier to protection. Security uh, doesn't mean that uh, the lack of privacy doesn't mean that we're more secure. That's what I think. Thank you. I, I think that was at least very clarifying for me, and I, I presume also for others. Um, Patrick, pra Pratik, um, over to you. Um, digital services from the global north, um, they have uh, 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 the, the things that are developed in the in the global north, the services that are deployed in the global north, um, have uh, 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 a large influence in shaping the internet, uh, if only historically. Um, and of course, that is creating dependencies on that technology uh, for everybody, including people from the global south. Um, India, however, has tried to face some of those challenges, and, and uh, um, I, I think it would be useful for you to explain what those challenges were and what, uh, uh, what insights we can draw from India's digital sovereignty policies that are relevant to the ongoing uh, encryption disputes. Pratik, over to you. Well, all right. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I was told I have about 10 minutes, so I've just started my timer to make sure I don't go over. Uh, I've got three things that I broadly want to cover right, through, through the question. And uh, I want to talk about encryption, but without actually, you know, for large parts directly talking about encryption. Uh, so I'll start with an example from India that highlights you know, that how actions taken by global North or Western institutions, right, and not just government, not just services, can have an impact in other parts of the world. Uh, I want to make a general comment on the idea of uh, regulatory contagion, right? Where uh, an instrument in one part of the world or one country is again imported into uh, other countries, even if they have different underlying objectives. And then finally, I'll just come back to specific and about India uh, and what and some of the current or recent regulatory interventions uh, th that are happening here and why some of them are concerning, uh, especially from the encryption perspective and more broadly from the individual autonomy uh, perspective, right? Uh, so as you you know as, as you as you uh, aptly asked, uh, digital services certainly have an influence. Uh, but uh, I, I want to talk about a very specific instance. So on August five uh, this year, right, uh, the New York Times reported on uh, alleged links between you know a quote unquote tech mogul in in America and uh, and propaganda networks uh, from China. Right, a lot of the details are not directly relevant uh, to the present conversation except for one point where they included a reference to a news portal in India that also happens to be very critical of the current uh, union government and for a number of years now has been at the receiving end of harassment, obstructions by the country's financial investigators uh, who themselves, you know, over a period of time uh, have become increasingly partisan in, term, in terms of the people they, they pursue, right? Now, as recently as last week, uh, citing some of the allegations in that in that very story, uh, law enforcement offices conducted, you know, quote unquote, raids or seized electronic devices of around 50 current former reporters, contributors, staff of, at the organization uh, called News Click, including arresting two people, the founder and the HR head, under a law meant for terrorism charges. Right? Uh, and this law ha currently has a history 
of uh, people being detained for months and years without uh, without a trial right now you could argue that the paper was not was not aware of the consequences of its uh, reporting but uh, people who who have who declined being quoted in the story have come out publicly saying that they did uh, inform them about uh, some of the implications of uh, of running with, with with the story in its current form uh, and one of the organizations quoted has also come out and said that the, the ultimate report didn't include it uh categorical denial right uh, so this this just goes to show that a- actions by institutions you know in uh, in the global north sometimes uh out of ignorance sometimes you know knowing fully well can have outsized effects on people in uh, in the global south and in in, in other countries right uh, and i want to quickly cross the atlantic ocean right from a us specific example and go to go to germany uh, and of course everyone is you know you know at igf is is likely aware of the network enforcement act or uh, on next dg right now i'm not going to go to the spe- going to specifics of the provisions itself and it's none of this is is a comment on its effectiveness in the german context because i you know do not have expertise there uh, but multiple scholars and researchers over the years have alluded to some of its provisions being imported by other countries right uh, uh, especially with more authoritarian Uh, leanings and you know apologies in advance i'll just quote run through some of them very quickly and apologies if i mispronounce some of their names uh, but but heidi torek in in a 2021 paper uh, stated that bills in you know at the time in malaysia vietnam uh, kenya venezuela invoked similar lang- single similar language about broad and elastic categories right and that, that that's the quote uh, that russia and singapore made made references to it in some form either directly or through statements uh, Isabel Cannon uh, refers again to Russia, Singapore, and and Turkey, and notes how uh, some of them have incorporated provisions providing, you know, requiring local presence. Uh, and this this has a, a context as you know, as we've seen in certain instances, uh, as you know, as reported with Apple and Google. Uh, in in some cases, recent Washington Post reporting uh, about India suggests that these local presence requirements have been used. Uh, uh to threaten companies and their employees as well right and in a and in a foreign policy essay uh jacob changama and joel fist i think cited a 2019 freedom house report uh which said that since net dg or the network enforcement act was was enacted about 13 other countries have enacted similar intermediary liability regulations using a similar framework right again i'm i'm making these points not directly from encryption but just to make so that these are you know these are the forces that these are forces or factors at play when you have regulation or when you have uh you know d- regulatory designs in some of these countries uh, th- they tend to get exported right and we've already made references to uh, the online safety act which is something that uh, you know we're watching very closely and with a lot of concern to see how some of that language then gets uh, it gets imported uh, to other countries uh, as well right uh, now i want to come now specifically to india right and i'm going to sidestep the definition of digital sovereignty because i know that that's much contested much uh, much debated uh, but as things stand uh, india is currently in the midst of rewriting a lot of its laws that govern digital spaces right and and unfortunately uh, there are there are several bad things in there that you know us as uh, civil society organizations uh, are concerned about and it and it matters also globally uh, because look of the sheer number of people in india it has a precedent setting uh capability and you know as as kiran ohara and wendy hall describe in their book it's a it's a swing state uh, for 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 you know future of a lot of regulatory practices right uh now there are three or four specific items of uh, regulation uh, that 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 I talk about right which is uh, the certain directions of 2022 the current draft telecommunications bill the digital personal data protection act uh, of 2023 and the current efforts to rework the inter- intermediary liability framework through uh, updates to current rules and potentially a new impending uh, impending bill right and a common thread before i get into specifics a common thread that that we'll see uh, is that a lot of them amass a tremendous amount of control and discretion uh, for the union executive uh, with limited oversight over their actions uh, and often leaving us you know very little to rely on other than just just verbal assurances which are not are not really enforceable in in a in a lot of cases right uh, so the certain directions which were notified in april 2022 uh, these imposed a 6 month log retention requirement on pretty much all internet services 
that operate in India. Uh, it specifically also had a five year retention period for various types of data. And there's some nuance here, but various types of data uh, for information retained about customers retained by, by VPNs uh, and by cloud service providers, right? Uh, what this means for zero, zero knowledge services, uh, I think is a huge, is a huge open question, right? Uh, then the, the intermediary liability framework, which is the IT rules 2021 and subsequent amendments uh, to it. Uh, these introduced, you know, uh, what GNI has called uh, hostage taking laws, right? Uh, they introduced traceability requirements directly relevant in the context of end-to-end -end encryption, which is essentially the idea that you can trace uh, messages on end-to-end -end -to -end encrypted platforms, right? You can trace them to the point of origin without compromising end-to-end -end encryption itself, right? Uh, you have provisions for a grievance committee that is appointed by the executive that has a direct say in content moderation decisions that uh, digital services uh, may take. And, and more recently, uh, uh, you know, a, a fact check unit being envisioned that will be used to uh, flag content about the government itself uh, as, as fake or false, right? Uh, then the, the telecommunication bill, which expands the definition of telecommunications uh, so broadly or define, the, define them so broadly that they can impose licensing requirements on pretty much any service uh, on the internet. And it, it, this is relevant because the licensing requirements then in, can potentially include uh, obligations to intercept messages, again, a direct implication for end-to-end -end encryption or identity verification uh, requirements, right? I, again, for a lot of services that people rely on and you know, with huge implications for vulnerable populations that tend to use, uh, use these services, right? Uh, then there's the Data Protection Act, which was, which was recently uh, notified, which imposes incidentally duties and potential for penalties on people uh, if they withhold any information uh, from, from the state. Uh, and in a very interesting inversion, it grants they, it grants the state the ability to process large amounts of personal data uh, under a clause for certain legitimate uses, but pretty much exempts the state from the right to erasure. Right. Uh, so you know, if if I were to come back, uh, and you know, it, it it it's not a happy picture uh, that, that 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 I'm that that I'm painting, but these are some of the trends that we're seeing currently. Uh, in, in India, and some of them have very significant, uh, I think, implications, right, for the ability of people uh, to be able to use end-to-end -end encryption services, not only in India, but globally as well, uh, because there is a precedent-setting ability that, uh, you know, th that it has. Got. I'll, I'll pause there. I realize I think I'm done with my 10 minutes. Thank you. That was a very comprehensive overview of um, of the issues and also um, clearly the sense of president sending uh, of, of all of this uh, came out clearly. Um, Pablo. Pablo is also online. Um, recently, WhatsApp declared that if the online safety bill were to be approved, and uh, in fact it has by now, the company would exit the United Kingdom. I, I believe there was a nuance with that if, if it would be approved and implemented in the way that it is approved, so to speak. Um, in, in the company's assessment, um, is there a potential risk of internet fragmentation of encrypted services providing stemming from uh, the anti-encryption policies, like the one uh, that is put forward in the in the UK, Pablo, please. Yeah, thank you so much for the for the invitation. I'm very glad to be uh, with you. Sadly, from Brazil, so it's two a.m. in the morning, but it's all good. Uh, yes, uh, I think this is a, a very important question, and in particular. Of course, I'm seated in this in this panel in, in representation of WhatsApp, but, but I am also a global South uh, person living in, in in Latin America, and I have been working for the Chilean government uh, on 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 these kind of issues in the past. So my perspective is both the company perspective, but also my perspective from the from the global South. And, and yes, the company strongly believes that 
the threats on encryption, uh, the risk that we are facing in, in, in UK, in the European Union and in other parts of the, of the world creates a huge risk of fragmentation in terms of uh, imposing, in some sense, lower uh, standards of security and privacy for global communications. Uh, uh, of course, internet is a global network, interconnected network. If one part of the network has lower standards, that has implications to, to everyone. And I think it's super important to consider the perspective of the Global South in that, in that debate and in that regard, because the effects of decisions made in the Global North, in few countries, uh, could have implications everywhere. And, and in particular, I would want to stress this idea that weakening encryption in one place affects the entire world. Uh, one data that I think is important to introduce in that discussion is not a technical data, it's a political data. Uh, uh, the Economist uh, presented this survey year by year regarding the, 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 the quality of the democracies in the world. No? And only 8% of the world population lives in full democracies, only 8%. And it's not by casualty that these countries are in the North, in the global North mostly, and in particular uh, in Europe, uh, uh, UK, of course. And 55% of the world population lives under authoritarian regimes or hybrid re regimes. 37% in authoritarian and there are authoritarian regimes where human rights are not respected. So the problem we have here is that if we, from the global north perspective, introduce pieces of regulation that weaken encryption because they believe that their institutions are strong enough, uh, the rule of law is strong enough, uh, and of, that would be fine from their perspective. I, I, I strongly believe that that approach is wrong, uh, but if they believe that, they should consider as well the implications of that decisions globally. And this is very important because most of the people in the world lives under flower democracies or not democracies at all, without rule of law, without proper institutions, without balance of power. So when a country in particular, the UK or the European Union, made a decision in terms to weaken an encryption, it's affecting the lives of people everywhere. Uh, the activists in uh, Nicaragua, the activists in Venezuela, the activists in um, Saudi Arabia. Uh, so I think this, uh, the, 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 this, this is why it's so important to have this discussion here in the, at the IGF because the implications are not limited to the borders of every, every country. So yes, uh, the introduction of country level regulations that weaken in encryption has global effects. And it's super important for the technical community, the civil society and the private sector to continue working together, trying to make the case that these decisions will be profoundly wrong and that will create a huge, a huge impact. Besides this idea that weakening encryption in one place affects the entire world, two other concepts that I want to, to, to mention. The first one, of course, is the falsehood of the trade-off between safety and privacy. Uh, of course, this idea that you can get more security, you can get more safety, reducing privacy is completely wrong. Uh, and we know that, but it's important to repeat this, this idea because it's, it's in the core of this discussion. And second, we can in encryption hurts everyone. Uh, this idea that it's still in the center, in the core of some of these uh, attempts of regulate that 
you can create a backdoor or you can create some way to reduce uh, features of uh, security for certain people is not true. Uh, we know that it's not true. Uh, so based on these three concepts, uh, I, 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 I strongly believe that we should continue fighting against those uh, ideas. And, and, and going to the idea of the status quo that you asked before, I, I fully agree with Mariana. Nevertheless, the status quo on encryption is better than the terrible uh, situation that we can be in the future if encryption is not protected. So I, part of the status quo uh, is important to defend as well in order to preserve certain attributes of the internet uh, that are already we, we have. So yeah, I think this is my first intervention. Thank you so much. Thank you, very clear, um, at least for me. Um, Juliana, to you. Uh, Brazil, 33 other countries with it have ratified the American Convention on Human Rights. It ensures, among other rights, the rights to privacy. Um, in your assessment, how might the extraterritorial impact on anti-encryption anti policies influence the rights safeguarded by this convention? Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I hope people online can hear me well. Um, and I would like to say that uh, in the Americas, when we talk about uh, privacy rights and data protection and other interests in conflict with them, the discussion goes in another direction and assumes uh, other interests, uh, other frames differently from regions like Europe. Uh, the right to privacy is not usually regarded as one of the, the most important rights and, and protections in our social context. And most countries in our region don't even have data protection legislations and are far from bringing this discussion to, to the table, which means that there are no procedural safeguards to, that could limit the state and non-state power in, in accessing and proce processing personal, personal information, which is the, the central issue of anti-encryption policies. And this favors uh, the flourish flourishing of those uh, very popular narratives that claim access to data for law enforcement agencies and other decryption measures, as, as a solution to protect other highly valid public interests, such as uh, the protection of children, security, and public, public safety. And at the same time, we are also talking about the region in, in Americas, where, where in many countries, an absence of uh, rule of law, independent, judicial independence, and democratic stability prevails. And, and because of that, state abuses of all sorts uh, are not subjected to, to strict control. And, and likewise, countries in Latin America and Caribbean, even the ones that have a, a long history of commitment in, to democracy, are guided by traditions of uh, violent repression of protests, uh, murder of journalists, persecution of human rights defenders, arbitrary arrests related to the exp expression of opinions, uh, criminalization of L LGBTQ people, uh, and of abortion, for instance. And, and the information about all this trivial behavior uh, is registered in private communications pr protected by, by encryption. So in, in this regard, at, at the, at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, we have in, uh, increasingly uh, received reports on the persecution and online monitoring of activists and journalists that report cases of corruption or, or that represent conflicts with the interests of the political regime in their countries. And, and the penetration of surveillance softwares and other methods of, of surveillance to persecute them. Also in Central America, there are a growing number of legislations that criminalize and suffocate uh, the, the work of NGOs being put in place. And these organizations rely to a large extent on the protection of their private communications in, and to, to do their work on defending human rights and supporting the victims. So keeping all this in mind, we should consider how this, this scenario can be pervasively be, field and this, this rights undermined by weakening end-to-end -end encryption techniques and giving government uh, agencies access to, to private communications. Because we are talking about a, a, an imaginary amount of data that, that offers comprehensive information about all thinkable uh, aspects of individuals' life. 
in, in, in context of abuse, it doesn't matter whether you have something to hide or not. Being a government's target is enough to be harassed by, by digital surveillance in case where what one says, says or what an organization does threatens the credibility or le the legitimacy of the regime or because one, one's behavior is incompatible with the government's moral agenda. And making the content of private communications available qualifies the, the, the state capacity to, to conduct, conduct those, those arbitrary measures to an extent that we are still unaware, which ultimately chews expression and intimidates activists, uh, activities of human rights reports, adds the pressure of reprisals to, to LGBTQ people or people who are pursuing reproductive rights, and in some cases facilitate also detentions and, and killings. And journalists, for example, rely deeply on, on encrypted communications to communicate with their, their sources and do their work of investigation and, and reporting and to shed light on issues of general concern that uh, support the functioning of a democratic and accountable political regime. Encrypted, com encrypted communication has also been uh, necessary for activists and pro protesters and has been threatened by states that continuously try to intercept communications in times of protest or un uh, civil unrest. And people who may be at risk benefit from encrypted communications to hold opinions safely and without unlawful interference on, uh, and, and attacks. That said, I would like to, to answer the question by stating that uh, the effects of uh, anti-encryption policies in the Americans go go beyond the sole protection uh, of privacy, as if it were detached from other rights. The encryption debate needs to be framed as a matter of human rights in a broader sense, and as a, ma a matter of uh, freedom of expression, given its, uh, its role as a, a gateway to securing the right to opinion, and the collective di dimension of, of freedom of expression, which, uh, which allows the, the society as a whole to to have access to critical information and, and knowledge. And, and the problem is, is still much bro broader than this because uh, introducing, for instance, the, the so-called backdoors or any vulnerability does not provide access only to specific actors as it is uh, usually claimed by the, these legislations. The, the introduction of this uh, vulnerability gives all malicious actors access to private communications and can be exploited by the same criminal and terrorist networks that the, the limitations aim to d deter. And the, conse the consequences are severe because uh, we haven't been seeing the, the reports of Snowden on state surveillance over foreign states around secret and strategic communication. And this highlights the effects on, on sovereignty and, and national security produced by the, the weakening of encrypted communications. So, and on top of that, uh, particular attention must be paid to the fact that undermining encrypted communications means that we are making even more personal, da personal data and data of all, all aspects of an individual's life available to private actors from the technology sector, whose capacities of uh, merging databases and profiling are already incredibly high, and who use this data to, to train and feed AI models and deploy uh, micro-targeting and recommendation strategies, for instance, which impacts the, the digital public debate as well. And, and in this sense, we, we should bear in mind that uh, digital technologies developed by these actors have become more reliant on, on user data based on demographics and behavior, and non-encrypted private communications uh, and private non-encrypted uh, policies offer a vast amount of this, this type of data and facilitate corporate surveillance. And when it comes to, to these digital technologies, this has not only effects on privacy, concerns of, of consent, and in the democratic public debate, as I said, but uh, it, it is also usually related to reports on bias and discrimination on AI models, and which ultimately has effects on human dignity, equality, and also non-discrimination rights. Well, besides that, I would like to, to highlight the, the, the rise of anti-encryption policies in jur jurisdictions of the Americas and in Europe could inspire other new repressive internet regula regulations in the region, since we have already seen in an increment in rhetoric used in online safety and security as a means to crack down on, on uh, internet freedom across Latin America 
and to put forward regulatory propo proposals to, to suppress human rights in the online environment. And if all of these uh, restriction efforts on encryption could represent these, these threats to human rights, especially privacy and freedom of expression, then their, their implementation must meet the, the well-known uh, three-part test, which states that any limitation on, on expression must be provided for, uh, for by law, may only be imposed uh, for legitimate grounds, and must conform to the strict text of uh, necessity and proportionality. And well, under international human rights law, uh, states are obliged to protect privacy and freedom of expression against uh, unlawful and arbitrary interference and attacks. And just to uh, to wrap up, uh, because I, I don't know, maybe I'm running out of time, but uh, I would like to state that we should move the conversation on, on digital communication in the di direction of advancing people's protection online and not people's control and incre uh, increasing surveillance. And s we should be uh, strengthening policies and enhance uh, human rights center approach to, to digital communications. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, um, I do wanna return to Professor Hatta. Um, I, I believe my question caught you a little bit off guard earlier, um, I, and I think you prepared some some opening uh, 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 statements. So I I want to make sure that I give you the opportunity to uh, share your prepared thoughts. Um, yeah, yeah, not really, uh, because um, I'm uh, kind of confused as to. Where's uh, Japan? I, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to talk about Japan, and uh, where's uh, Japan? It's the global north or the global south in this context. Um, I mean, um, yeah, so Japan is uh, one of uh, developed countries, and uh, we enjoy uh, freedom, on internet, basically, internet freedom and uh, working democracy. Uh, but, uh, um, Japan is not really a trendsetter on this um, encry encryption regulation or something um, because you know we don't even have a big tech, any big tech. And so, um, how can I say? So I, I understand that the Global South uh, is increasingly um, regulating encryption and uh, maybe uh, uh, oppressing democracy or something, and uh, st still, mm, so then, then um, you so how can I say? Um, so in J even in Japan, um, uh, many people actually, you know, uh, do not support. Many people do not support uh, privacy or freedom or something. Uh, we have a bit of um, authoritarian tendency, and uh, so we we actually used the um, the West or global North influence on um, making um, our or something, so we, we uh, every country could go either way, anti-encryption or pro-encryption, and, uh, and uh, many country is not um, originally, I guess, I'm not, I'm not sure, um, many country uh, are naturally um, pursuing uh, freedom or something, and uh, uh, we counter the tendency with the uh, global north or west uh, philosophy or uh, um, uh, um, policy. And, uh, but still, I think I heard that the global south people think um, the global north um, influence um, is not uh, always good for good global south 
policy or something. I, I might be misunderstood. Sorry, I'm still <laughs> being caught off guard, but uh, I, I, so yeah, my, my main concern or my main question is what um, am I supposed to talk <laughs> as a member of Global North or Global South? Well, I, th thank you for your thoughts. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, the things that I, 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 I thought about when discussing this, maybe there is also a, a West-East dimension to this, to the, to, to the way that people approach this, uh, this issue. Um, but I want to turn around. I, I do have uh, uh, questions, but for, uh, the audience, um, either online, uh, and I trust that somebody will uh, uh, take care of the online questions if they're there, or in the room. Are people who want to uh, add comments or say something or ask something of our panelists? Well, in that case, I'm going to ask a question. And of course, panelists, um, uh, uh, feel free to discuss among you. Um, question that I have um, around WhatsApp. Um, so the threat or threat, yeah, I think it's a threat that WhatsApp made was at some point, uh, if this law is going to be enforced in the UK, if, uh, if Ofcom is developing uh, technologies that will be able to scan content on, uh, on the machines, uh, and we're pretty sure that's not safe, then we will draw from the market. Um, but if you do that, um, you provide that market no encrypted service any, any longer. Um, and that means that the people who live there don't have any, uh, any means to communicate with, with confidentiality. Um, of course, that also fits in the playbook of, uh, 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 of, of, of non-democratic nations um, that would like to see encrypted technologies go ra leave rather than come. Um, what's, what's your thought on that? Is the threat of leaving actually the threat that you want to make? If I may, I, I, I can start with this one. Yes, please. Um, I, I, I will not say that this is a threat. Huh? For, for WhatsApp, encryption is in our DNA. Uh, uh, WhatsApp is an encrypted platform, and this is part of our definition. This is what we are. And it's critical for WhatsApp to preserve that. And the issue with the regulation that is being discussed in in UK and maybe in the European Union as well is that we strongly believe that this kind of regulation will break encryption. Uh, we strongly believe that client-side scanning it's against the principles and the characteristics of encryption. So, if that regulation is in force and we have to implement uh, client side scanning in order to continue operating, that will create a huge risk, not just for the UK people, but also for the rest of the world in, uh, as well. So it's not a threat, it's the idea that in order to keep operating as an encrypted platform, it's not feasible uh, for us to uh, comply with that approach if the deal is approved or is implemented in the way that in the in the worst way that we we, con we are considered so it's important to clarify that it's not that we are pressing regulators in order to uh, change the democratic decision of certain country is that we are stay saying that we will defend encryption in the same way that we went to the Supreme Court in India to uh, try to avoid the traceability uh, provision that was decided in the IT rules, in the same way that we are debating in, in, in Brazil against uh, traceability uh, as well, we are defending encryption. And the idea that uh, to break encryption in, certain, in, in one country 
for a global platform, global communication platform as WhatsApp is just not feasible. No, but, but uh, I, I think even uh, uh, if it's not a threat, but really the result of not being able to operate the, the, the service under your quality in a, in a specific nation, the result is that you're out of that nation after the regulation has been put into effect. And that might actually be uh, 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 also a way for, uh, um, for, for countries to, to impose a regulation and see Signal and WhatsApp all leaving that country and leaving the population of that country without any encryption. Perhaps any of the other uh, uh, panelists would like to respond. Ah, there's a, somebody from the audience. Thank you. I uh, love this panel and I just wanted to comment on your question, the last question. I think there is no compromise possible for these platforms. Uh, once you compromise on encryption, then um, I mean there is no, no, no going back and, and then you, you, there is just no more encryption possible. I think that the question you asked, and um, forgive me for this, but it's a false dichotomy because it's not that either you you, you, you comply and then you offer your services to all these people or you don't and they don't have access to it. Like there is another alternative to all of this and this relates a lot to uh, technological literacy of the people within that jurisdiction and I think that um, we can work more on this and uh, the same way in authoritarian places where uh, some of these um, apps are forbidden, people still have access to, to them, then like the same can be applied in other form of non-authoritarian per se uh, jurisdictions too. So I think that there are third, fourth, fifth uh, alternative ways to do this. Thank you. <coughs> uh, my name is Claudio Agosti, I'm part of uh, Hermes Center, and uh, I follow a bit the uh, discussion on uh, uh, cryptographical protocol. This year has been uh, standardized the MLS, Messaging Layer Security, uh, from the EATF. And it's a protocol that allows um, group encryption interoperable. And interoperability here is the key because uh, uh, imagine that, uh, in fact, uh, some of the um, country want to hinder encryption. And uh, the first question was about how much this can create fragmentation. But in theory, if we have a network that is interoperable, the network became global. Depending on the client you have, you can plug in. And uh, I hope uh, the person in this, in this state uh, can still get uh, access to um, clients that are uh, secure in their interest uh, without do scanning and without uh, weekend encryption. But uh, this uh, provision, this infrastructure can guarantee that uh, the world uh, is safer as possible and do not exist uh, let's say, um, a monopolist that uh, can, uh, in fact, influence a billion of people. And as far as I know, uh, this was endorsed uh, by Wire, by Google, and uh, uh, not uh, by Meta. Meta actually withdrew their participation from the working group. So my question from uh, our uh, speaker from uh, WhatsApp is uh, if uh, he has some comment, and uh, uh, if somehow do you think that uh, interoperability will also um, ensure more safety for uh, all your users or uh, you want to avoid it because uh, it's the best way to keep the monopoly. Thank you. Hi. Uh, look, I, I'm not uh, the technical expert on, on, on encryption at all. My background is the economics. Uh, the point that we have raised regarding interoperability, then it's, it's, it's regard the technicalities, how to implement that without reduce uh, or introduce or without introduce additional risk. And there is a huge discussion with different perspective and a lot of uh, experts has the states that the interoperability as, as uh, is uh, proposed or decided by the European Union in DMA uh, could create uh, some uh, vulnerabilities in terms of how the uh, information is protected uh, and which standard, who will decide the standard, why one a standard, how that will create implications in terms of the 
uh, develop, the, the development of the of the of the different standards. There are different approaches on on on, on encryption, on end-to-end -end encryption. Signal protocol is one. There are other uh, approaches or the other technologies. So it's not an easy question. Uh, it's it's important to have more uh, solutions or more uh, protocols that in 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 the pipeline and. It's an ongoing discussion, of course. It's not a dogmatic approach on that. The critical aspect from our perspective is to assure, ensure that the high standards that we are introduced using the signal protocol on WhatsApp is protected. And at the same time, and it's also the other side of the discussion, is that the integrity measures are also available in order to avoid some kind of the misuse of the technology that is already a risk that we already know that. So it's an uh, ongoing discussion, and I, I, I would prefer to have uh, other people from the company explaining the technicalities of our approach. We have um, the chair of the IAB who knows everything about the ITF standards process. Not everything. Oh, almost everything. <laughs> Hello, my name is Mia Kühle and I'm the chair of the Internet Architecture Board. Um, I wanted to comment a little bit and I would also like to um, comment on your part, but I also want to comment on like your idea. What happens if, uh, you know, we don't have an encrypted communication platform anymore? And there's one thing which is like there are a lot of circumvention techniques so you can still access services in other countries because the Internet is a global platform. Um, so it's really hard to block access from just one country. I think that's a very important point. The other point is also encryption is not a layer. Encryption is a function that you can implement on every layer of the stack. And the stack, the way we design the internet, the, the way we design the internet architecture is that you can kind of stack things on each other. So you can also always kind of add another layer with encryption somewhere else, right? So this might then be a cat and mouse game or whatever. Um, so that, that's also I wanted something to say. It's like if you, if you try to break encryption here, this is not a silver bullet because encryption is and security is a function and not like thing, something that you only deploy in one place. Um, and then to like comment on, on the IETF, I cannot speak for Matter, of course, but I think you cannot generally say somebody has withdrawn participation or whatever because we design standards that are a couple of companies are involved in the designing process, hopefully enough companies so we can design a good protocol at the end where we have like agreement between a large enough group, but we design our protocols for like all <laughs> internet participants, right? So everybody can adopt that. And for this specific case, um, the reason why we're standardizing something is not necessarily interoperability. It's not that, like hopefully we, we come there as well, that like different platforms maybe can talk to each other. Um, but the reason why people came to the IETF to standardize that is to actually get this engagement from other companies and then get a really good and, and secure and, and well-designed protocol. But it doesn't mean that like other people who don't um, deploy this protocol doesn't deploy encryption because as the person from Meta just said, there are many approaches to that. And it's not about interoperability if you talk about encryption within one platform. So I wouldn't read too much into um, like who is actually actively driving work in the IETF. It's more important who is actually adopting and deploying these technologies. Yeah, and that work really came out of uh, a DMA requirement, Digital Market Act uh, requirement, or Digital Services Act requirement, I want to. Not, not the DMA, it's the, right. the um, I, uh, I was asking a leading question, actually, so I want to clarify that a little bit. Um, suppose that uh, we lose uh, Sigmo from the market, we lose WhatsApp from the market, and I think you also touched upon that. Then one would hope that people are looking for different alternatives. And of course, the issue with companies like Meta, like Signal, like Telegram, uh, they have an office, they have a corporate presence. And I, I, uh, my prediction would be, if something like that happens, the, the users that, the internet always routes around its problems. That's a famous quote. I, I don't know who said it, but the internet always arou routes around the problems. Uh, or the, only, the internet only just works, just uh, always just delivers what, what you need. And what I think what will happen is that people will start to move to decentralized services. 
just like the Tor network, Professor Hata, you've been working on that. The Tor network provides decentralized mains to provide encryption. Uh, during the, RS, the, um, the, the security conference in Las Vegas, God, DEFCON, yeah, the cult of the dead cow uh, released Valid, uh, a new protocol uh, that's highly distributed and uh, has privacy and um, confidentiality uh, uh, guarantees. Not to say that that has stand the test of time yet, but at least those type of things I think the world will move to. That was, so, sorry for my, uh, uh, for my inter intervention here, but that was a, a, a leading question in, in some way. Hi, um, I just have a quick question, I think, for the WhatsApp uh, representative, and I, it, just on this topic as well. Um, the question for me, I've, my focus on round encryption is that it's oftentimes one party of the two-party com conversation is the one that's requiring your encryption. Uh, oftentimes it's the way that diasporatic populations communicate with each other. And so when we talk about legislation that removes WhatsApp from UK, a country that has tons of uh, migrants from all over the world, tons of, of, um, of citizens who have families in other parts of the world, is this a frame of like, is this a form of uh, oppressing the global south who are the, your, your earliest users and your earliest um, uh, audiences and they find the most use out of this uh, to this day? Um, do we see the parallels between the no global north shutting down communication lines that the global south uses and then we've spent decades uh, condemning folks who shut down access to Google and do we see there might be a similarity where the north cares about encryption and shutting it down, um, I'm sure, sort of sure the south does as well, but isn't seeing how that is an oppressive uh, concept and does WhatsApp have thoughts around this? Um, I'm going to wait for you to comment there is a question online that i want to take in and there's a question in the hall or a remark that i want to take in and then i go back to the panel uh, thank you tapani talpainen electorate frontier of finland uh, your comment about going around it i guess the quote we were looking for that internet interprets censorship as damage and routes around it does not that breaks with client side scanning if they go all the way down to the operating system they make google put android sensor everything when you type it when you speak it before it goes to any application then you're an apple just two companies and then you're out of luck i think that's a correct observation um the question that we had online was from monica uh, Ermet, uh from germany hi uh could one conceive a legal case against a government that with its encryption legislation is in violation of international human rights uh, by which it has uh, signed up. Um, um, so, yeah, there was a typo in that sentence, but I think that's a, 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 a good question to you. Um, is that a case one can make? Well, yes, we, we do uh, a lot of with that in the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. We have uh, in the Americas a lot of proposals, regulation proposals and, and other efforts of uh, non-encryption policies, including Brazil. And what we do in the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, it's uh, basically we have uh, reports and uh, we issue recommendations to states and to private companies on, on those violations of human rights and, and how this affects uh, human rights uh, besides only privacy, uh, as I said, like freedom of expression rights and disc discrimination, non-discrimination rights and human dig dignity. And uh, we also have uh, other mechanisms such as uh, public hearings, uh, where we also uh, receive uh, civil society and other actors to uh, to make a case and discuss with uh, with states uh, around those those violations, so it would be something in this in in this line. Thank you, uh, Juliana. Um, and there was the question. Um, yeah, uh, but uh, in the meantime, I would like to offer uh, uh, Pablo uh, the opportunity to answer the other question in the room, if you can. Yeah, sure, super, super quickly. Uh, look, WhatsApp, of course, don't want to, to 
stop working on UK at all. Quite the opposite. WhatsApp wants to keep operating with the highest standard of protection with end-to-end -end encryption worldwide. WhatsApp is mostly a global south platform. By far, most of our users are in the global south. India, Indonesia, Latin America, Brazil in particular. Uh, this is where most of our users are. And we have the duty and the, the responsibility to protect those users uh, all the time. So, of course, we want to continue working and operating in the United Kingdom. And we want, and this is why we are pushing hard, and we, this is why we have this coalition with other companies and with the civil society in order to avoid having a regulation that will affect, uh, that will affect uh, uh, encryption. Because we strongly believe that th this kind of regulation puts people's lives in jeopardy, not just in the UK, but worldwide. So this is the point. Uh, and this is what we want, and this is what we will continue doing. It's not a threat, and in, of course, we want to protect the diaspora. We are we are trying to protect people ev everywhere by defending and encryption, and we will continue doing that. Thank you very much. Um, in the last five minutes of our panel, I want to give the... Um, the panelist, a uh, opportunity to uh, to give final remarks of uh, each one minute. Um, starting with uh, Juliana. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to say that uh, we either have, uh, when, when we are talking about encryption and human rights and online and digital communications, we we don't have an in between situation. We either have encrypted and and protected uh, private communications or we have readable messages and, and communications. So we don't have evidence that, uh, that shows that mass surveillance allowed by, by non-encryption policies have ever been effective to proportionate safety as, as these policy efforts claims. claims. So I guess it's that. Will always be abused, that's what you say. Yeah. Professor Hatta. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of confused and uh, I couldn't uh, reply property, property, property this time. Um, I, think, I think the basic attitude is that uh, technology doesn't choose the country or users. So, you know, even if the country regulated it, uh, we can use it. Or, yeah, like uh, WhatsApp or uh, Apple or uh, Signal, like select Signal, and just walk away and uh, you know, just exit. So I, I still don't understand the, the, this, this, this discussion's main point. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not, I'm not sure what way out means, but uh, you, you know, users can use it if, if, if even if um, it's banned or prohibited. So I don't know. So the global south problem about the um, regulation or something is basically a political problem in global south countries. So. Mm, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's, uh, it's, I, it's okay. I, I, I still get the main point of this discussion, yeah. but maybe I'm the only one. So Th um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, going online, um, uh, uh, Mariana, please, final thoughts. I just want to thank for the debate. I think it was a very rich debate. And I leave here my my voice to echo with Juliana and say that encryption is a human rights matter. And I think it's essential that we preserve encryption and the global south take the position of protecting it and not threatening it. And I hope that in the future we can, in the near future, we can adopt this position of relevance as we did post Snowden uh, revelations and, and, and wait
which we built a very strong civil rights internet framework in Brazil. And I hope that we can also take this position in relation to encryption too, in building regulation or even in building policies that are better in strengthening the encryption in Latin America. Thank you. Um, Pablo. Yeah, well, thank you so much for the invitation once again. My final message, I think it's it's critical to civil society, the technical community, and the private sector reunited at this IGF to continue working together to convince some of the governments of the global north that weakening encryption won't make their own societies safer, but will put millions of people at, at risk. And most of them, most of the people affected are in the, in the global south. Thank you so much. Thank you. And then last not but le uh, not l last but not least, Pratik. Uh, thank you once again. I think this was a very interesting discussion and conversation. Uh, just two quick points. I think one I will echo, I think what have been called across the room about the need for solidarity to protect in, in encryption and end-to-end -end encryption, because I think uh, we are headed for a slightly tumultuous period in, in that sense, and there is need for a lot of us to work together to ensure that it remains uh, defended, protected, and advanced uh, in the years to come. Uh, second, not so much of a remark, just to, just a lead. Uh, I mentioned traceability. Uh, some of you will be interested to know that, uh, that over the last couple of weeks, there is a case in India where a high court has handed out its first traceability order, uh, which uh, I believe WhatsApp has been able to go and get a stay for. But I would just say watch that space, and uh, we'll have to see how that one evolves. Thank you for that. And uh, with that, I would like to, to thank the panelists and the engaging audience in the room for input and comment. Um, I hope and think there is hope for this uh, dossier, uh, for keeping encryption available for everybody. Um, because we also heard um, that uh, if we start eating away at it, uh, not only at the legal side, but also side that will cause uh, a race to the bottom and uh, we're not there to see that happen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.